So, um, common behavioral health problems. And, and as we go through this, I tried to, to use the same sort of pattern each time. So, talking about what it is, um, how it impacts learning, and then that empathy piece, that perspective taking of a voice um, that has dealt with or is dealing with this so that we can hear kind of from the horse's mouth what, what it's like to live with these uh, problems. The, the primary one that comes up um, across the board as we're talking uh, all the way up to high school is really, is really the, where we're stopping today, but these of course persist into college populations as well. One of the most common is some sort of mood disorder. Um, someone earlier was referencing bipolar disorder, and bipolar disorder of course is one of the mood disorders, um, but with a variable sort of expression. Depression um, consists of the following sorts of symptoms. Um, not every person suffering from depression will manifest all of these. Um, and similar to uh, the gentleman who was talking about two students with ADHD, two different students with depression may look very different. These are just some of the core features we tend to see. A persistent low mood. So when you look at the DSM, it says that this has to have been, have, have been going on for at least two weeks consistently. We all experience sadness, we all experience grief, but depression is something significantly different. You also see something that's called anhedonia. And anhedonia is a fancy word for a lack of interest or pleasure in activities. So what you'll see is students who formerly were very into cross country and cross country was their life and this year they didn't go out. Or um, students who are always very socially involved and always uh, tended to go out a lot with their friends and suddenly they're staying home. So they've stopped exhibiting an interest in the things they used to care a lot about. You tend to see changes in sleep and that can go either direction. You see students who before um, didn't appear tired, who are suffering now from insomnia at night, so they're sleep deprived. Um, you also see students who will sleep a lot more than normal, so who will escape into sleep and sleep more than is typical for them. Similarly, changes in appetite are really common and one of the vegetative symptoms or one of the physical symptoms that happens with depression, but that can go either direction too. So you can see students who suddenly lose weight, who are suddenly not eating at lunch times, but you can also see students who are suddenly gaining weight or who are eating dramatically more than normal for them, they're comfort eating. Um, and so really what we're looking for from uh, educator perspective is changes, sudden changes in behavior, sleep behavior, appetite, um, interests and activities. You see more fatigue often, you may or may not see tearfulness, uh, particularly with like adolescent populations. Um, does anybody know what the substitute symptom among adolescents is often? Anger. Anger, anger and irritability, especially among males. So you may not see tearfulness at all. You may see acting out, you may see irritability, you may see agitation where you hadn't before. Difficulty concentrating is very common. Um, young people, and all people for that matter, dealing with depression tend to have recurrent thoughts of death or dying. This may be suicidal thoughts, but it isn't always. Sometimes it's um, just sort of a preoccupation with dark topics, a preoccupation with death or loss or, or those kinds of issues. And then feelings of guilt or worthlessness are also very common. So a sudden change in a student's self-esteem or their confidence or their demeanor um, can also indicate concerns. Are there other things that you have maybe seen among your student populations when you've been dealing with students that are depressed? Frequent trips to the nurse's office. Oh yes, somatic complaints we call those. So uh, depression can manifest, um, and it isn't always that a student is just being avoidant, although that can be something too. So physical complaints can be a way of avoiding the classroom when students are depressed because they can't stand to be there. But it's also the case that depression can actually manifest itself in very physical ways. Stomach aches, stomach problems, headaches, very common. Anything else? Okay, so when we think about that symptom picture, how does that impact students? Remember that anywhere, when you look at those studies, anywhere from 4% or 10% at any given time of students will have diagnosable, not just little bits of symptoms, but diagnosable symptoms of 
major depression. Um, the difficulty concentrating can mimic ADHD. It can make schoolwork difficult. The lack of interest or the anhedonia can change performance and motivation. So previously students who cared about their grades and were motivated to work may suddenly lose that. One of the only warning signs you see in a good student might be a sudden drop in grades that's uncharacteristic of them because that motivation and that care is gone. Um, feelings of worthlessness can make self-injury more likely. Um, and again, that's both suicidal self-injury and also just the kind of self-injury, cutting, burning, that we're gonna be talking about in a bit. Um, school avoidance is also likely as people struggle with depression, uh, trouble getting out of bed in the morning, um, trouble being around other people can lead students to just stay in bed, stay away from school. So when we think about how these symptoms directly relate, um, it, we see acting out, we see lack of effort, we see skipping of school, we see poor concentration, so a wide spectrum of behavioral changes that we will be able to observe among our students. Very good point, Anitra. Anitra was uh, mentioning poor hygiene. Um, this is another indicator. It isn't necessarily something that's a DSM criteria, but we see it. When students stop being concerned about things, one of the things they often stop being concerned about is bathing, changing their clothes. So they may wear the same clothes over and over again. They may have very greasy hair, not smell very good, and that typically is a change from how they normally would present. Anything else come to mind? What is the yellow bubble? Yellow bubble just talks about lack of effort. It's not, not, not trying, not caring. It's often misinterpreted as laziness. There are a lot of myths, and we were just, uh, during the break, actually talking about some of the myths involving depression in young populations, and I think these are very dangerous uh, myths to have. It has long been the case that many, um, even professionals, even mental health providers believed that depression was really caused by stressful life events, and therefore, children could not truly become depressed, right? Because they hadn't lived long enough um, to, to really have experienced most of them, the kind of trauma required for a true depression. Um, another myth uh, is that depression is just sadness, that people should simply work through it, um, particularly young people, that they should not be given antidepressants because antidepressants would mask the symptoms and just kind of cover things up and cause them not to deal with things the way that they should. Similarly, um, people have been told at times that they should avoid antidepressants for their children because they wouldn't want their children to become addicted um, or they wouldn't want taking antidepressant medications early to put their children at risk for other addictions later on. And the reality, the, let, let me talk for just a minute about the reality. Um, obviously the first one, um, I don't feel like I, I, I feel like I would be preaching to the choir to talk too much about that one because I think you have probably, how many of you have seen depressed youth in your classrooms. Okay. How many of you have seen depressed youths under 15 in your classrooms? Okay. So I don't think we need to talk about that myth too much. I would like to talk for just a minute about, I'm not sure why it's varying, but up and down, about this idea that antidepressants mask symptoms and we should avoid them if at all possible, um, or that antidepressants should only be used in cases of extreme harm like suicidal ideation or self-injury. Um, it is the case, uh, based on research, that, uh, some, that a practice happens with depression that's called kindling. Does anybody know what kindling is? It just feeds on itself. It does. So kindling is the idea that people who become depressed and remain depressed, children, adolescents, adults, without treatment, um, it kindles the depression and they are more likely to become depressed again in the future they are more likely to have postpartum depression when they uh, get pregnant, and they're more likely to have more severe depression later on. So it really is the case that treating depression at any age where it becomes significantly impairing is probably a good idea for that reason alone, that it kindles itself, it grows, and it becomes more problematic later on. Um, the idea that antidepressants are addictive has no basis in research. 
The medications most, most commonly used and most effective with depression are things like SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, SNRIs, and there really is no significant research that indicates that those, uh, that those medications are addictive or put people at higher risk for other kinds of addiction later on. And in fact, what we do know is, uh, what do we know about addiction and depression? They will find other ways to, to treat the addiction, right. to treat the depression. So what we do know is actually just the opposite, that people who remain depressed and it, and, and it is not treated medically are likely to find other means of trying to treat that depression themselves, and those include drugs and alcohol, and then lead into addictions. And then again, this myth that depressed students can be identified by sadness and cheerfulness. Sometimes that's the case, but it isn't always. And so don't overlook the adolescent male who is angry and irritable and lashing out, um, because those can be indicators too. Really, as, as educators, we're looking for change. We're looking for changes in behavior, things that are unlike that student um, in terms of physical presentation, emotional regulation, anything along those lines. Questions? Okay, this is a video, um, Kevin Briel, um, and it is part of a TED Talk that was done. And um, Kevin Briel is 19, or was 19 at the time of this video, and had been dealing himself with depression for some time. Um, he was also uh, sort of known as a comic even at that young age, and is a very gifted kind of comedian. So this is him describing um, his experience with depression. 